What's happening, folks? Today's show is sponsored in parts by LensRentals.com. Lens Rentals is the largest online rental provider for photography, videography, and lighting equipment and accessories in the United States. They carry camera bodies and lenses in every format from every major manufacturer and all the audio, lighting, and support accessories needed to cover any kind of shoot from a family holiday card to a commercial advertising job. All equipment purchased is sold within two years, so customers are assured their stock is always in like new condition. So check out LensRentals.com. Use the code RODY15 to get yourself 15% off your order. That's RODY15 over at LensRentals.com. What's happening, Rodies? This is Matt Boudreau. This is Peter Levin. What's happening, Rodies? This is John Guadari, and you're listening to Rody Free Radio. What's up, Rodies? My name is Larry Milburn, and this is Roadie Free Radio, your VIP pass to meet and greet the stars behind the scenes of the music and film business. All right, all right. What is happening, Roadies? Welcome back to yet another episode of Roadie Free Radio. This one happens to be episode 174. My guest this week is Mr. John Guarnieri from Silver Spear Security and head of security for Shine Down. Let's uh, let's get into this week's episode because it's going to be good. Hey, by the way, this is your host Larry Milburn. I am coming at you from a barn in Northwest Connecticut. How are you guys? How is it going, man? Are things well? I hope so. Hope you had a nice weekend uh, as best you could out there in the COVID madness. Hey, before we get started today, I just want to give a shout out. I I read on the Roadie.net uh, page here that uh, Jimmy Mears passed away. And although I did not know the man, he is a roadie for life, and uh, we we want to send our love and condolences. So, so there's to you, Jimmy, for years of great service, man. Uh, folks, we got a new sponsor alert. New sponsor. Here we go. Hello TV. Eric Rogers and Paris Vizone are now sponsoring Roadie Free Radio as I am sponsoring Hello TV. We've worked out a sick deal, man. And uh, if you don't know what Hello TV is, check it out, man. These guys, again, I'm, I'm just so impressed by the cool and interesting and different things people are doing to pivot during this crazy time. And Hello TV is certainly no different. This is a weekly concert series All right. They take all artists of all genres and these things are safely filmed in a secure, clean studio and they're pushed out to social media outlets of the artists, the sponsors and of course to Hello TV. Uh, So it's like a nice, clean, beautiful studio. These guys know what they're doing. If you haven't caught Eric's episode here on Roadie Free Radio, please head back and do so. Great guy. Paris has also been in the industry for a long time. They've combined their experience open this great facility, you walk in as the artist, you set up, you record, you do your thing, and it's streamed all over the place. And 25% of all the proceeds go to Music Cares and the National Independent Venue Association. So big shout out to Hello TV. That's H-E-L-L-O-O-O-T-V.com. Hello TV.com is the spot. Thank you guys for joining up here on Roadie Free Radio. And folks, you got to head over and check out some shows, man. They're streaming all the time. Great stuff. Uh, speaking of Music Cares, this one really, I, I'm, I'm just so humbled by this. And it, it really, it's just it just goes for all you guys, man. It's just so awesome. So last week I announced on the show that I was going to be giving away 100% of the sales for the next few months of all the no roadies, no rock and roll stickers, right? I got the stickers, like let's just move them and give the money to Music Cares to help some people. So I announced it on Monday on the show and then I think about Wednesday, I posted it on Facebook uh, and all that kind of stuff on social media. And in less than 24 hours, I think it was, 36 hours, we raked in about $1,250. Now we're up to close to $1,500 off a sticker, okay? It's unbelievable. People are buying like three and four, three packs of the No Roadies, No Rock and Roll stickers. So listen, every every little bit helps, right? $1,500 is, you know, someone's mortgage, someone's car payment, someone's groceries, someone's, you know, Netflix subscription to keep them, keep them entertained during this time. So 
It, it's just their health bills, whatever you, wherever you want to spend the money, man, it, it, this helps out a lot. So again, for the next few months, all proceeds from the no roadies, no rock and roll stickers will go to music cares to help folks in the audio community, the music community, I should say, uh, get through this time. So, and just thank you guys again for, uh, for spreading the word, getting it out there. It's really awesome. Uh, someone else is doing some amazing stuff is my buddy, Liz Shaw. I don't know if you guys caught this this week, but check this craziness out for the longest time. The city of Nashville has had a law on the books that you could not work from home. You could not support yourself in a home business and have people come, whether you were doing you know, music recording or anything like that, or you were a hairstylist. If you wanted someone to come to your home and cut their hair, you were actually legally not allowed to do this. Liz has a recording studio at his home. He got shut down. And for the last year, I think it is, he has been fighting the city council uh, to pass this bill and get home businesses back working properly and legally in the city of Nashville. And he did it. He won this battle uh, this past week. It's so cool. They voted 25 to 14 to approve a new home business bill. And that means that everyone in Davidson County can now support themselves and work from home. And so if you need to have a customer visit your home to teach a guitar lesson, cut their hair, edit their website, record a song, whatever it is, you are now allowed to do so legally. It's really, really cool. Uh, and so you got to you gotta give it up for Liz, man. And that, that's just a cool thing. That's, that's democracy in action right there. Um, continuing to give shout outs to people. My buddy, Kevin Gorey, um, has become a, become a buddy over the last couple months. <clears throat> and a few weeks ago, or a few months ago, sorry, I started posting that I was going to help people uh, consult on their podcast and help them launch a podcast. And Kevin has done so, and I'm super proud of him. I wanted to give a shout out here. It's got nothing to do with audio stuff, but Kevin is a young guy, and he had, a, he had bypass surgery a few years ago. And it's completely, obviously, changed his world. And so he started a a blog and a podcast to tell his story and to hopefully inspire others to, uh, you know, take care of themselves. And maybe they've gone through the same thing and they just want to commiserate on the experience. So if you check out gorybypass.com, that's G-O-R-E-Y. B-Y-P-A-S-S dot com, dot com. You can hear his story. He's going to start bringing guests on. He's about four or five episodes in. He's going to start bringing some doctors in, nutritionists and whatnot to talk about stuff. And look, I know, I know the realities of the road out there. You know, people don't always take care of themselves. And uh, this could be a good, a good resource for you to, uh, to think about doing that type of thing. So check it out. Gorybypass.com. Kevin, good on you, buddy. Good for good for launching and good for starting. Uh, Tour Supply. Guys, they need your help. They need your help, man. They've been there for you. It's time for you to be there for them if you can. Like I said last week, buy, buy a roll of tape if you can. Buy a guitar tune or something like that. Or head over to GoFundMe.com and check out uh, Save Tour Supply. And you can make a donation to uh, to keep them in business and rocking and rolling, which you should. GoFundMe.com. Check out Save Tour Supply. Hey, we are sponsored today by Show Pro Beard Co. Started by live audio engineer Chris Wilson, known as the Audio Wizard on YouTube. He and his wife have created their very own unique formula of beard balm that not only performs well in terms of health and nourishment, but also provides the control, shine, and pleasant aroma that any bearded professional would appreciate. These non-waxy, all-natural beard bombs will leave your beard soft, smooth, and nourished. Choose from a variety of natural-smelling scents like Home Sweet Home, Morning Wood, Through the Woods, Chain Motor Oil, and of course, Original Unscented. Use the code RODY to get 20% off your entire order. That is RODY to get 20% off your entire order over at Show Pro Beard Co. This stuff works, man. Even if I have a little stubble, I still like to rub it on my face and my neck. It just uh, just feels like I'm starting the day right. All right. This week's guest is Mr. John Guarnieri. 
COO, that is Chief Operating Officer at Silver Spear Security. He's also the head of security for the band Shinedown. He's a 2008 Norwich University graduate from the Corps of Cadets. Spent several years with the Secret Service. He's been deep inside on campaign trails, festivals. Uh, we talk about, you know, the, the art of taking responsibility and moving forward. We got deep into some good stuff, man. It's, it's, you know, it's the first time I've had a Secret Service agent on the show. I think that's pretty cool. And uh, just things to think about when you're at a large venue or a small venue and how... You know, not only has event safety evolved in the last, you know, five to seven years, but now with something like a pandemic on our hands, how do we safeguard our people and ourselves against things, you know, like that, that are out there? So good episode, good stuff. Also, quick little plug. Next week, I got Megan Holmes from Eighth Day Sound on. Good episode. Good times. It's good, good stuff. Uh, Listen. Two last things for you before we jump into this interview here. Uh, Michelle Petnato, you remember Michelle Petnato? She was on the show a little bit ago. She's got a course called Mixing Music Live. Want to give a shout out to her. And if you would like to learn about live sound and mixing from someone who's been the sound engineer for some of the greatest names in popular music, well, man, you got to check out Mixing Music Live. It is an introductory course on live sound and mixing. Michelle has had a career as a touring concert sound engineer for nearly 30 years. She's been with Gwen Stefani, Goo Goo Dolls, Styx, Melissa Etheridge, Adam Lambert, and many, many more. Her episode is episode 153 if you want to go back and check it out. So she's taken all of her experience and knowledge that she has gained over the years and broken it down to the essentials you need to get out there and start mixing. It's a great time to brush up on some skills if you're looking to do that or if you're thinking about starting in the audio industry, uh, this is a good course to jump into. And uh, we've worked out another deal, 25% off for you guys listening to Roadie Free Radio here. If you use the code Rody 2020 that's Rody 2020 you get yourself a 25% discount. You can use that code or you can use the links in the show notes for this show and uh, it'll take you, it'll take you right there. All right. Uh, what else I got for you? Liz Shaw. Oh, yeah, man. Liz Shaw, Recording Studio Rockstars. He's got a killer course that you got to check out. His links are in the show notes as well over on the profile page here for, for this episode. So hit those links. Check out Mixing Music Live from Michelle Pettinato and uh, brush up. Brush up on some skills. Liz's, Liz's course, Liz's course, it's, it's, it's a tough name for to say, is uh, it's more studio-based. Michelle's live sound. There you go. What can I tell you? All right. Enough jibber jabber. Let's get it going with Mr. John Guarnier. Hit it, hit it. Call yourself a roadie. Call yourself a roadie. Call yourself a roadie. So do you, what, did you just get out of the shower? Get out of the gym? What no, are you doing? I, no, I just got done working out. So I, I nice. didn't want to shower. Like, I didn't want to rush through. I mean, I can, I can knock this out. I mean, yeah. Unless you need me to be on video. No, I don't need you to be on video. Oh, okay, cool. I just wish the people had a visual of you now. You look like you're in a Turkish bathhouse. I love it. Yeah, I, 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 but you can tell people that. <laughs> How you doing? Where are you, man? Are you in are Massachusetts? You in, you're Massachusetts. Okay, right. Because I yep. noticed Norwich University, of which you are a graduate, is up yep. in Vermont. Yep. Where in Massachusetts are you? Um, I live in Pepperell, Massachusetts. So 495 Route 2, well, 10 minutes from Nashua, okay. uh, New Hampshire. Got it. Okay. Got it. Got it. Cool, man. Um, but you're not, uh, are you usually, you're usually on the road with Shine Down. Yeah. I mean, if it's not Shine Down or it was Nickelback before or with, we have, we do a bunch of stuff with high net worth clients too. Like I go to South America, Mexico a lot. Uh, but we also do a lot of high profile events and festivals. So yeah. usually on a normal year, obviously with all things considered, I'm probably on the road 300 days a year. Wow. Wow. And so I moved up to Massachusetts to be close to my parents just to help them out when I'm home. Yep. Um, it, sounds like, live, it sounds like you're doing a lot of that. <laughs> normal, yeah, no, normally it's, in the yeah. Normal year. And I know it's one of those things where you kind of, I know some people are kind of get down on themselves and I, obviously people's careers and jobs are lost or affected by this. But at the end of the day, you just got to kind of keep true to yourself and just try and create something whether it's right i mean i picked up writing a lot i've done a lot more of the i mean this is the first like pro pro one i've done with you um in terms of this type of podcasting but yeah 
I think people get so complacent, like, oh, woe is me. But you know what, man? That two years from now, it could be a worse pandemic. Now are you still going to be the same person? So right. control what you can control and just uh, get better. Take classes, learn. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you the number of stuff I just started reading and just all that stuff. You know, it's funny you say that because I've been saying that since the beginning on the show. Is like, you know, this is this is bad. It's been bad. It, it the projected out for the year is not it's great the worst. for people. It's the worst, right? But it's going to end. Like, there's going to be another side of it. And it is, I've been saying, you know, it is what you do with this time. You know, for, for everybody out there, I don't care if you're a roadie or whatever, you know, when, if you travel a lot in your job, uh, you're always out on the road saying, God, when I get home, I really got to clean out the garage. Or I'd what? love to paint this bedroom or I'd love to put it on the porch. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, do it all now, you know? Yeah, get because it done. if nothing else, it gets your mind off it. And, you feel a sense of accomplishment because you've you've set forth a task and you've completed that task and that Correct. makes you feel good. And then you can put your head down on the pillow and say, all right, well, I might be fucking broke for the next year, but God, my house looks awesome. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> it, I know you know as well. You hear people in catering or backstage like, man, this day sucks. It rained out or I got to pull cables because it's hot or this barricade security guys suck or right. this camera's too heavy. It's like, dude, I'm, I'm curious to see some of those people if they kind of realize now that your day in the sun at the festival at the parking lot for Vans Warp Tour really isn't that bad, all things considered now. Right. And it puts stuff in perspective. So I, yeah. that, I think, is a lesson I think we all need to learn. Yeah, for sure. Well, good. I, I'm sure we just pissed off a few people. So now that we've done that, dude, <laughs> you... Uh... <laughs> you know what? If you can't be true to yourself, then... No, I, I'm I'm just joking. But, uh, but you know, I mean, I, look, some people are out there hurting, you know, and, and uh, they've watched not only four months, five months of their career go away or their, their work go away, but possibly a year, most likely well, a year. It's, right? it's one of those things too where, I mean, I, I refuse to talk politics. Like I, we all have our own beliefs, but one of those things where this industry, you don't hear a lot about helping the gig worker. I mean, everyone from catering to videographers to security to ushers to everyone associated with the show, lights, audio, like they're affected by this. So where's their kind of, like, where, how do you protect them, I guess? So I guess moving yeah. forward, I know Live Nation's doing stuff and all that crew nations, which is all great. But at the end of the day, like, how do you help this situation better next time it happens? And it's got well, to. Well, it's funny you mentioned Live Nation. I don't know if you heard uh, this this episode a couple of weeks ago now that just came out compared to, to yours. But uh, I read the, a couple of quick bullet points from Live that Nation. memo or whatever. Yeah, the yep. memo that came out. And I guess that's how they're going to take care of themselves. Yeah, it's curious. I mean, I, I have a ton of friends at Live Nation. I have a ton of friends at AEG. I have Frank's Productions. Like, I, I will never I, – I don't get that side of it. I stick right. security, so I don't even yeah. – man, I, I – sure, it's cool knowledge. I'd love to learn how to settle a show or what goes behind the scenes of that side. But, yeah, it's one of those things where I, I wish there was more that could be done for the gig workers because you hear stories of good friends that are like, I need another, I need a new career now. Yeah. But you just can't jump into a career where there's no jobs. Right. Then you have to relearn a trade, go back to school. You got to. So it definitely has a kind of domino effect. I just wish there was a way to kind of help everyone. Yeah, I do too, man. I do too. Well, I want to tell you, it, it's, uh, you know, when you reached out, I was very excited to have you on because aside from uh, my first NAM show, which is a couple of years ago, three years ago now, I guess, where I hosted a panel, co hosted a panel about event safety. Yep. Um, I have yet to have someone in your position on the show oh, and, awesome. in terms of security. So it's, it's good to have you. And, uh, I'm glad we can sort of break down, you know, why you got into this line of work and, and how it was pre COVID and how you sort of picture it post COVID. Um, but so, um, I want to ask you this one, man, as you said, you, you travel a lot and, um, you're not right now as much. Right. And so for someone like you, who's used to constant planning, um, constant anticipating, uh, you know, practical logistics of moving people or a person right. or an asset as you call them. Right. Uh, the right. Physicality or, well, the of the physicality job of the protected. job, yep. right. That, that you get off on that, which is why you do it. Uh, do you miss that right now? I, I do. I miss the physical part of it. Um, you never want to deal with a situation. Yes, you're trained and a conference really happens. You physically get ready to do it. But I miss more of the um, – like seeing the people in different cities. 
Yeah. I've come to meet awesome promoters, uh, local police, local security, uh, local crew. And so I miss that human aspect of this industry because it's a great way of networking and kind of getting out and appreciating what you do at a national and global scale. But if for in order to, I mean, for us, Silver Spear Security, we we are the, we're about to open up a training academy in Florida. Wow! For guard cards, DAG license, and an EP class uh, for more executive protection bodyguard type stuff. We're doing cool content with famous martial artists, survivalists, um, former Secret Service people. We're working with to create cool content, like scenario based stuff uh, for social media. Uh, here's the thing, too. We, when the riot started, uh, not the protesting, but the actual, the anarchists, where whoever it was doing the riot part of it, mm. um, our state security side of the house is booming. Uh, we have people in California and Florida, and uh, I think soon to be Nevada, uh, just high net worth celebrities that were watching their states. So that doesn't go away. We do some HOA stuff uh, that's not affected by this. So it kind of makes you kind of – we might have like 12 pieces in our pie. Yes, three or four slices might be kind of messed up right now, but make the other one stronger. Mm -hmm. And then when everything opens up again, hopefully the pie is the best pie we can kind of put together for ourselves. So give me a, give me the, the scope of, of, of um, Silver Spear Security, how it started, how you got involved. Um, in 2000, well, 2008, after graduating Norwich University, the military Corps of the Cadets, Navy ROTC, I um, started the Secret Service in D.C. So from 2000, late 2008 to 2014, I was at the White House with Obama. Oh, wow. So, so, you, so you elected, because I want, I want to get into sort of the minutia of it here. You elected after Norwich that that's what you wanted to do? Or yeah, so I, is that, I basically they place you in that. So how it happens, I, I, if you graduate Norwich University and you're in, you do like one of the ROTCs, you could graduate as second lieutenant, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force. Okay. I never chose to do that. I had some personal family stuff back home where I didn't want to commit to four years. I don't know where I'm going to be. Um, so I still did the four years Navy ROTC, loved it. I'd go back tomorrow and redo the whole thing, get yelled at by a staff sergeant. I love everything. The yeah. lifestyle. That's folding, a, that, that was at school? That was at Norwich? Yes. Okay. I didn't have a TV till senior year. Wow. So I grew to appreciate the small things. I'm very – man, if that bunk on the bus is four feet long, I'm getting in it. It's the best bunk in the world. So <laughs> um, so junior year, I put in for – I had a buddy that joined the Secret Service and was doing motorcade um, for all the stuff in D.C. and traveling the world. And he's like, man, you'd love it. Like your type of personality, like everyone's cool. Like, you like it. So I put all my eggs in one basket, which a lot of people – I don't know if I advise a lot of people to do it. I just believe that I could get I could get in, and I could do what I want to do, and I got in. So it's it was three months training in Glencoe, Georgia, um, and then three and a half, four months up in Beltsville, Maryland, where it got more specialized, like uh, uh, rope lines, more of the executive part of it, uh, surviving a helicopter crash, driving, evasive driving, all that stuff. You kind of scenario based stuff you come across. Yeah. So I did that, and in 2012, I met my CEO and, honestly, my role model industry, Chris Loudon Hawk, um, at backstage at a Charlie Sheen show. He was doing security for after his whole thing, the two and a half guy, or whatever that show he was supposed to do with that Torpedo of Truth tour, yeah. where it was just pure mayhem. Yeah. Well, I met him, and people are hanging out, meeting Charlie, and like, whatever. But I see uh, Chris loud in the corner, and I'm like, man, I want to go talk to him. Like, I know what he's there for. So at that, point, at that point, you were Secret Service? or what? what yes, I was still Secret Service. Okay. My friend, whatever, we had tickets. We had some VIP thing in okay. D.C., so we went. Um, and I see him. I start talking. I'm like, man, this is so cool. Like, I was more interested in what he was doing. And so like, here's my card. Here's my, he gives me his info. And he's like, hey, when you're ready to get out, give me a call. We could do some damage. Well, the campaign in 2012 – um, I was maybe home 30 days that year. Wow. I spent four weeks straight in Rancine, Wisconsin. I was in Teaneck, New Jersey for three weeks. Like, it just, the campaign's ungodly. It's, it, you don't know what city you're waking up and you're dealing with literally millions of people every month. Yeah. Um, and so, so, were, so like, you were one of Obama's detail? I was uniform division. So okay. I was everything. We do all the um, advance work, all the gotcha. security, um, all the control for. Access control, anyone that comes into the sites, the advance work and stuff like that, we would do all that. How many of you are there at that point? 
Uh, I mean, depending on the the event, I mean, I th- at the time I think there was probably close to ten thousand in the world. Wow! Every the whole agency from snipers wow. to uh, Kata, ERT agents, uniform division, anyone counterfeit. That whole umbrella, there's probably 10,000. At that event, depending on, because I was think I was doing Romney stuff, Romney or Bi- one of them. And, uh, and so the events were like arena stuff, like an arena show. Wow. So that type of crowd. Yeah. So every, anyone that infected that show, staff, house, media, would all, we have full control of it. And so after that campaign year, I'm just like, man, I, I got to get out. And so I went through a divorce. Um, and I was kind of like, man, I need to kind of do like a reset. So I called Chris. I'm like, man, I'm ready to jump out. I jumped out. And ever since, we've been uh, kind of doing it all. So Chris, he started off decorated Marine. His class, first clients were Motley Crue in their heyday, Tool, System of a Down. I mean, he, you name it, he's done it. He's been with Nickelbacks from the very beginning. Wow. Um, and so we've, I've kind of been grandfathered in through him. And learning from him every day, it's just been awesome. What's so. the what's the like threshold? I'm just kind of curious for a band. Like, at what point does I guess the band or the management or someone decide like we might need to get some badass dudes around here? Um, I think it's well. I mean, obviously, budgets everything. Okay. Uh, I mean, if it's, I think security is one of the first things people don't look at. It's also one of the last things they look at. Yeah. In the sense of because if you want the right person, you're gonna pay for it. I mean, mm-hmm. if you're going to hire some Craigslist bouncer type or some guy that's high and drinking all day, just there for the show, like, you're oh, cool. Anyone can afford that. Yeah. I, you don't want that in this day and age. Right. And so I think it's one of those things where once the, once the radio play picks up, if, there's, if they're active social media, if they are a political band, if they've done controversial stuff, um, are they a girl band? Do they have a girl in the band? Is there crazy social media presence, stalkers? And I think it all kind of bring, brings to a boil. And obviously, as you know, once you get on those big tours, there's a lot that goes into the advance. Yeah. And so the stage manager, production, and tour manager can only advance one aspect of it because it gets so big. And when you bring in a security director, then you start doing the advancing, helping with the bus parking, hotels. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. Is it, I mean, let's just take Shine Down. And the campaign, I mean, you're still doing a lot of work. You're still waking up in a lot of cities. You're still doing yeah, it's, that's that sort why, of thing. So, that's so is it really a break for you to, to go it's, private? It, it, this is going to sound weird. It's a different type of politics. Okay. Uh, where the government, you're very political. Like sitting through some of that stuff, like the whole healthcare summit stuff, or just being there for some of these crazy things. You're just like, man, I don't even know what's real anymore. Because gotcha. you're there, and you're witnessing it, and you're seeing it, but you're just like, I'm just so numb to the attacks on either side. But yeah. when you get out to the tour stuff, yeah, there's politics, but it's more, it's you're there for your one job. Right. I could be myself, professional, still be in my days off, do be myself, but you could also, you're still human, and you're still, you're not... You're just there for one thing, the band and the mm-hmm. artist security, and then ultimately that that, that order. Um, so for me, I was just kind of like, I, I need this change. I can be my own boss, which I like, mm. and I answer to the CEO. And that's the only person I answer to. Right. When you came in, did you come in as COO? or did, I came in, in, well, we, yeah. So I came in as operations man. It was because I'm the only full-time besides CEO in the company. So a lot of time, obviously with tours and stuff, we have to do, you hire people on basis or we're getting to the point now we're actually hiring staff staff. But um, I came in, I was doing security security director for uh, Nickelback. Wow. So I jumped right in. So I, and I saw a lot of people like, oh, you just jump right to a band that never did a van tour. And I'm like, you know what, man? I, I oh, cool. I don't care. I'm here for my job. I don't. I don't care what you've done to get here where you are. If you're a good person, that's all I care about. Yeah. Let me do my gig. You do your gig and stay out of my way. Right. And I, we, you, I say it jokingly, but you just kind of like, I, I put my time in elsewhere too. Right. We all pick our careers. Yeah. And so if you want to be the best at what you do or you want to keep pushing yourself, then keep doing it. Prior to Norwich, what was your – you know, what were your high school years like? Were you, was, was the military in this life something you always knew from an early age or what was your thing? 
Um, I've always, you know, you grew up watching like John Wayne movies, Cops and Robber. Like I've always loved like that action kind of good guy versus bad guy. Um, and so I never, yeah, it's one of those things where I've always been, I help people. I like helping people. Mm-hmm. I like if something bo- does go Boy bad. Scout? Are you a Boy Scout? No, no, no. Okay. Um, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> so I like, I very, I mean, I love the outdoors. I love being um, alone. I love the idea of just, if you need to get something done, get it done. And so I've kind of just, I think the idea of helping people if something does happen, I, I have, I have no problem and no fear whatsoever trusting myself to do the right thing to save lives. Mm. And so as you get older, that kind of exemplifies where you go through certain training or you go through like different classes or you see firsthand real world experiences or situations where you kind of, something happens, you learn, you improve upon it. And if it happens again, you do an even better job and one of those things. So yeah. I'm a big proponent of always keep learning, studying. It's okay to Monday back quarterback something in your own head mm-hmm. just to run through scenarios in your head. Yeah, I know you do it too. If you're at a show and power outage or a fire alarm or something crazy happens or water, like you, yeah. you've already put, you've already in your head, if this happens, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. And so I can't stress that enough for people just to keep improving that. Yeah. No, it's funny, man. I, um, and it was, it was, it, I started doing it prior to the event, uh, safety, uh, episode or whatever I did at NAM was start looking at shows more. It was more just, I think getting older and being more aware of my surroundings. Right. And so when I go to, and, and talking to other roadies prior to that stuff, cause this is like sort of pre, um, you know, Bataclan and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, He's just always looking for the exit, even on an yeah. airplane, right? I get on an airplane, I sit down, I'm like, where's my nearest exit? Uh, yeah, man, the, if you're in a movie theater, I always sit, try to sit in the end row where I always keep shoes on if glass breaks. If I'm in a restaurant, my back is always in a solid looking out the window. Right. And so it's one of those things where I think everyone should do that regardless. Yeah. I mean, obviously when you can control it, but... Yeah, it's I think when people after, don't think about it, do they think you're <laughs> they think you're a little crazy? Because the first couple of times I'd be with my wife and I'd be like, "Hey, listen, if anything happens, if we get separated, just go here, you know, or just head over yeah, there, it, right? Do uh, that." And she's like, "What?" And I was like, "Just go right. when you go to the show. Look, like we went to our our sweet little idyllic town that's mostly white had a Black Lives Matter protest probably two three weeks ago now, something okay. like that. And we got there. And there was a lot of people came way more than I expected for our town. Right. It filled up the whole middle of our town. And so when we got there and we parked, it was probably like, you know, probably two blocks away from where the thing was where we parked. And we got there because we brought our five-year-old. I was like, listen, anything happens, just run straight for the car. Just go straight back that way. <laughs> you know, right. uh, don't try, don't try to run this way. And I think it's just a, a mind shift, you know, and the more I've, I've talked to crew members and whatnot, same thing, you know, if you're front of house, you sort of figure out where you're going to go. Just always have an exit strategy, I guess is my point. My long way. No, way. it's it's great. I mean, after that bad acclaim, man, then you start realizing the, these merch guys are out there literally. They might as well be on the street. They're right. literally behind a, a pane of glass. Yeah. And you're kind of like, well, what, we, what can we do to help the merch guys? Or Do they know where they're going? Do we send out um, the building evacuation plans? What is the plan if there's an active shooter? How do you – so it's all part of like, my world where it's like how do you de- – talk with the police and EMS and fire. And, I mean, I've been some places in uh, Belgium a couple of years ago where they had some issues with like the initial migration of the immigrants in Germany yeah. in that area. Yeah. And you're dealing with the military now because at any moment you can have someone just start throwing bricks through people. And wow. so you're just kind of like be socially aware of your surroundings. Like I can't stress that. I, I mean, everyone can find catering, but on the way to catering, you should get lost down a hallway in case you have to run down the hallway and find a way out. Like, mm-hmm. I, it's just, I don't know. I think people should do that more often. Yeah. But for so long in this industry, and I'm sure you've seen it as you've been in, uh, you know, I, I imagine you've seen sort of gaps, you've seen blind spots in people th- in people's thinking in the, uh, in the music industry, because for so long you had groupies, you had stalkers, you had that sort of stuff, but things have changed in the world now, right? And so people don't really think about it as much. Yeah, I mean, in the grand scheme of stuff, stalker, yeah, stalk, yeah, you, it could be an issue, but groupies and like the backstage crazy, as crazy as it is, man, it, it, it honestly isn't an issue. If you if you have your head on for anyone back there, like you, as long as you control the situation, it's, not, it's when you throw in unattended bags or guys with guns now, mm. and it's... 
like in Manchester where it's like you get everyone to run out and then you already have secondary explosions ready to go. So it's like it, it's not fair. It's a sad world we live in where you have to be ready for that type of stuff, but it is necessary. Do you find as you're going out and you're advancing things or you're talking with, you know, artists or management, let's say, do you get some pushback in terms of like, oh, man, come on, John, uh, but there a little, is, a little here, intense. There, there is. Yeah. I mean, I always find it where I, I don't, I'm not some of the things worst case scenario, but I don't also sugar coat it. So if there is, if I get, we get Intel that there is a guy with a possible made a death threat to the say, Iowa state fair. He got laid off. He's a gun nut. He loves whoever, what candidate, and he wants to shoot people up at the fair tonight because there's a country singer. My first thought is, well, this is a guy with a gun. You trust law enforcement, security, do a job, but you got to let people know. So for us, we'll, I'll kind of speak with the tour manager, stage manager in our in our world, and then I'll go to the band, kind of let them know, and then talking with the tour manager, or management, we'll word it in a way that it doesn't scare people to do their jobs. Mm-hmm. We're also, we have a really veteran crew with Shine Down. So I'm not, I'm never, you could be direct with them and they appreciate that. But I, there is, there is a way of saying stuff and getting your point across without scaring people. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, man, it's, I remember my first time at the O2 and the Wembley O2 in the UK with Nickelback. Our last show of the run, and that morning there was a bomb threat on the subway under the arena, uh, where a train was stopped. Unattended bag, guy said it was a bomb. He was blowing everyone up. Well, I, the guys were asleep on the bus at eight in the morning. You got to pull them in. You got to bunker down. You got to stop deliveries. You got to stop the ferries coming in. So like you all this stuff, and the whole time you're kind of like, I think I did the right thing. I think I did the right thing. You look back, sure, nothing happened. Like so, the stuff like that, I. I don't wish it on anyone. I just wish there was a way where we could sign up. And one of the training things I want to do is where crews can come in and we can run through some like insane scenarios mm. that will happen, could happen, and how do you react to it? Yeah. yeah. I think Communication is key, too, in every department. Right. If you're having a bad day, don't be a douche to the uh, caring people or the guy in audio or the – or the uh, truck driver, like you, it, when it's showtime, ready to go, you got to watch out for each other. And right. I see, you see a lot out there too, where people hold grudges and man, when the shit hits the fan, you better make sure those guys are all with you on the same team. Right. Right. When you, before you got to Norwich, did you have, you didn't really have any, did you do any martial arts training or anything like that? Or no, you, I mean, no? I, I was, I've always been fit. I've always been an athlete. Yeah. Um, so I never did that. As I got older, I kind of got into, um, Specialized training, like through the Secret Service, they do a lot of like Krav Maga type stuff. Yeah, it's all survival based, like weapon retention and ba- basic self defense, where it's realistic. This isn't like bowing with your gi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shaking hands, like this is real world. A guy comes at you with a knife, how you gonna disarm him? Type stuff. So th- that type of practical training, and I I try to do as much as I can, uh, but I never got into the martial arts per se. I think it's awesome that yeah. dedication to that. Yeah. Um, it was more like how much of your persona was, you know, already gearing up for this experience yeah, I mean, Norwich I guess, and going into this world. Or did you get to Norwich and you're like, holy shit, this is either A, awesome, or damn, you know, this is going to be work. Yeah. No, it's one of the things where I like, I, I always love yelling. I love chaos where it's, if you do something wrong, you, you own up to your mistake, you get screamed at, you do push ups. If you mess up, your whole team pu- gets punishes, punished. And so, that I love that mentality of just always being on the wire and the chance where the, you have to be perfect mm-hmm. or always try to be perfect in what you do because it could affect your life or the effect of others. And so mm-hmm. as you do four years of that at Norwich, then you add on the seven or so years at Secret Service, and then you add on this. Like you, You're always constantly kind of just always push yourself to get that same excitement I got out of someone screaming at me like i don't if i did nothing wrong and someone screamed at me i would have a problem with it sure uh but i do love that intensity um mm-hmm. uh, where you're always under the microscope and you need to be shit hot all the time do you miss a secret service uh, i miss the people um there is a lot of changeover um i know through there i mean i do a bunch of people where it's just like divorces alcoholism because i like you said the road isn't cut for a lot of people 
Yeah. And you see it on the road too with touring guys with alcoholism, family issues or drug issues. You're kind of like, you can't help everyone. If you can't help yourself, don't expect someone else to help you. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I miss the people. Yeah. I mean, I still see the cool places. I've, I've been to every state and I've been to almost probably 80% of the countries. Um, so I definitely, I would not change a thing. How much stuff happens? We can, we can break it down to, you know, the, your political side, your secret service side and the entertainment side. How much stuff is going on? That we have um, no that we have no idea. Okay, is so going on. like you'll, I mean, obviously now the media is very. I don't subscribe to the media on either side right now because it's too. I don't know what you don't know. It's just everything slanted. Yeah, and so when I was doing the Secret Service stuff, you see everything firsthand. Like you would, you would know. Oh, cool! Like, they got a Bin Laden before it's announced. Like stuff like that, where you're kind of like. Oh, they passed the healthcare summit like two hours before it gets announced. Like stuff like that, you're just kind of yeah. like. Um, but there's bomb threats every day. There is attempts on the president's life. There's attempts on any official that we secure, protect. There's attempts on. There's threats every day. Mm. You don't hear about them um, because it's you've gotten so accustomed to doing your job, and that it's part of the part of the protocol. Yeah. Um, and so I laugh when the, recently it was like, oh, Trump went to the bunker. So what? Like, that's our job or their job to get him in there. Like, he, he's the president of the United States. Like, I don't care. There's, there should be nothing political about hiding in the bunker. Right. If, even if he wanted to, whatever, even if he was like, you're going to grab my wife, you're going to grab my son. You're, our first action, we're grabbing you, sir. Then we'll grab your family. So this is our call. Right. And you have the right people in place to do that. Yeah. I just don't like how they kind of politicize that aspect of sure the job per se uh but every tour you do there is you have the every city will have that baby that one stalker that sends weird emails and social media messages or um crazy stuff it must, be, it must obviously it's part of the job but it also must be exhausting because you have to you have to take every threat as a credible threat. That, that's the thing too especially this day and age because anyone can literally show up at a venue and some of these venues like you know you pull up to the backstage of the buses the general public's right there yeah there's totally. a couple of security guys yeah that you're hoping are great they usually are but the minute they turn the back some guy could jump that stupid bike rack or pull it apart and now he's got a gun or a gonna so you just kind of like i can't i can't tell you how many shows i've gone to as roadie free radio right and right I, I used to go with a camera and stuff like that i used to go to more shows before it was just easier to do the show like this through a Skype call. It got, got too expensive at the time. So how many times I would just roll up and be like, Oh yeah, I'm doing an interview or, you know, whatever, especially if it was an outdoor gig. Oh, oh yeah. Like you said, yeah, like Tedeschi yeah, trucks, code. yeah, right. Tedeschi trucks at Simsbury Meadows. I just crawl, you know, cruised on back there and was hanging out by the buses until I met <laughs> the guy I was supposed to interview. And I was thinking I have a tripod case and stuff like that. Anything could have been in there, you know? Right. Crazy. And that was only a couple of years ago. Right. Where shit had yeah, already so, happened. I mean, that's, you know? There's always that. And then festivals too now. Everything You have the dressing room compound over here. You got VIP over there. You got the stage you want to go to. You got two bad guys that want to go over there. Right. Which, I don't know if it's an issue, but as you start moving around and you got 60,000 people moving around too, you're just kind of like, man, this could get really bad. And especially if there's a tornado or inclement weather, you got people running to their cars. And Jesus, right? You're just like, oh, I hope no one gets trampled. And so every show, like I always get a back report. I always know how many people get evicted. Um, usually nine times out of ten, it's a drunk guy. There's you been a couple that, of times. To- a post, a post right, right. Report. So I, you, you, I, so I advance aware after the show. If I'm not at my desk, leave it on my laptop, or yeah. email me a PDF of like the events that happened, how many EMS calls. What call was it? It was a diabetic. Was a heart issue. Was it dehydration? How many fights? How do you you use that information post show? And so I I, I have I have every single uh, report from 2014 to now. So I probably have Jesus 3,000 reports. And so every time I go back in that city, I can pull that out. It's usually the same staff. It will kind of snicker and be like, "Hey, remember this time? Um, See if not." I don't know if we can beat the arrest, but see, you can kind of, you can basically build your own kind of graph of 
how were trends change like going? Is the older crowd being an issue now? The younger, and then also too the event of litigation or something happens or someone sues like oh one of the crew guys or the bad guy knocked over a camera on me or the the bad guy threw a pick in my eye or I'm sore for this. Well, I'm looking at the report now. I don't see any medical calls. Mm-hmm. So that right there tells me you, this is the story's bullshit. So you do it to protect yourself, your company, but also the band, the crew. And so I, I definitely think even if you don't have security with you, I think everyone should always get those reports. Wow. That's fantastic. And, and, and probably super informative, like you said. I mean, yeah, like, there's some <laughs> cities too, where you get like certain festivals where you're like, yeah, like you, uh, we always joke, like we, every time I've been in Edmonton, obviously with Nickelback and even with Shinedown now, it's been like a blue collar hockey crowd mm. and it just fights and they're all farm boys and girls and they're just drinking beer. Like there's never an issue, but there is, and by I say issue, I mean, there's never every time where I'm like, oh, this crowd sucks. This is too violent. Right. right. But they are, they keep you on your toes. Right. I mean, every time I've been there, the last time with Shinedown, the first time I was there was them. I think we had 56 people over the barricade. This recent time, 92, in a fight in the in a fight in the barricade, wow. and they're just so you look at numbers like that, but you take that same type of people in Wisconsin, no issues, right? Or Texas, but New Jersey might be rowdy, California might be rowdy, Poland's crazy, but uh, Italy might not be crazy. So you kind of, I, I just like look at the numbers and kind of being like, it's kind of cool seeing. Those stats in real yeah. time. Yeah, right. That's amazing, man. Um, what are what are the, some of the hot countries that you know you see them on your list? You're going to like uh, Jesus. That one's going to be that's going to be. Uh, I think the, when it first started, like the whole Germany area with uh, the the migrant, um, all those refugee. I think the refugees. Um, and so you're kind of like, and eh, there's a lot of influx. It's political. We were just in Paris. During the Paris riots, mm. the hotels, you could see the streets being shut down. And so when that happens, you're watching the news, you're talking with the Live Nation promoter there, you're talking with the local police, venue security. Hey, where are these riots coming? If their riot blocks the doors to the, the venue, how we get people in? Is the show going to be delayed? How do we get to the hospital if they start blocking exits? Where are our buses parked? So when, you have to be kind of cognizant of what's going on in the world, too. Yeah. Because um, it could change on a dime. Right. Um, like if you were in the U.S. right now, there's no COVID, but you're, there, there's still uh, pro- protests or peaceful or not, you still have to deal with an influx of 70,000 people walking around the city that night. And so it's the stuff you always have to come across. Yep. Um, I think – I don't know. I mean there's – that Germany area, Belgium, Brussels, Paris, you're always kind of like, eh. But there's I, – I would go there in a heart. I'd go there tomorrow. Like I love those countries. I love the people there. Yeah. Um, South America. I've done a couple. I've done a bunch of details in like Juarez, Guadalajara, Mexico City, and everyone's kind of like, "Oh, it's yeah, it, it's Mexico City." I, I, man, I think New Jersey's worse off than Mexico City in terms of crime or Chicago. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like Juarez and Guadalajara, you read about it, you know what's down there. You always see in the news like cartels, people beheaded, kidnapped. But if, as long as you're smart and you don't do anything that draws attention to yourself, being an idiot, there's no issues down there. Yeah, I mean, it helps if you've been down there a lot. You have a good like a tour guide or um, a uh, interpreter with you and stuff. But you're never. Those would probably be the scariest places I've been. But I mean, I've been down in Rio um, for the Olympics right week before when that all went crazy, and. It, you just got to deal with it. Yeah. Take me through one of your days on tour for folks that don't know. It's just sort of like where you are, what you do. You travel with the band. You're on yep, the bus. I'm with the band. I'm on the band bus. And so, so if we had the show, bef- we had a show that before we're rolling to a show day. I'm usually, um, we have our song manager, um, engineer, uh, Chris Lightcap with us on the bus and our merch guy, Ken Sinkler. And so us three are probably the first couple up, just kind of wake up at 6 a.m., wait for the trucks to unload. I'll usually make a coffee or grab a Red Bull, sugar-free, like trying to cut back on the sugar, and then kind of walk around the venue. I've already advanced it. I probably already know the security guys working there. Right. So I'll grab coffee with them. We'll talk about recent shows, how the crowd's been. The police will show up or give me a call. Hey, we're on site. If you need us, let me know. Meet up. The guys will slowly wake up. They have their own routines. They're either working out. 
eat a strict diet or we got to do a um, uh, in-store meet somewhere, meet and greet. They do a group workout. They do VIP meet and greet stuff. And then slowly, depending on how many bands are on the bill, you slowly build up to the um, the show day. And so you know, the actual show itself. And so it's one of those things where there's a lot of walking around per se, but I try and make t- – there's always something going on. I mean I've been there – on the loading dock in Utah, where a worker in the morning, a loadout, had a heart attack and died. Mm. We're doing, we're trying to resuscitate her. She, so stuff like that, you're always cognizant that someone could fall and get hurt. Not even your own crew, the local people. Right. And that, and then, all, that all falls under your thing. Yes. Mm. And so if it's bad weather coming through, if we got to move stuff, push doors. I mean, then, then you start talking with the foundation or whoever the promoter rep is, yeah. tour manager, production stage manager but and there's a you, lot of, are you the only dude for the whole band yeah i am for them wow um really? so as they get bigger i think as well as they're gonna need someone just to deal with because that doesn't include when we go on days all yeah we have days off but if we do like a, a group dinner or we plan some like excursion like going to a water park or something fun like a movie night you still have to advance that right. you still have to worry about bus parking um checking at the hotels making sure there's no press there that's more of an issue in, say, Russia, where people will try to find your rooms and try to get in your rooms, or they know where you're staying because the live the promoter rep has already told people mm. where you are. And so it's it's nonstop. Yeah, there's times where you can kind of just let loose, and by let loose, I mean you can kind of no you're you're fine at just Applebee's in Omaha. Like that's what I'm trying to say. And right. so, right. But it's never ending. I mean, there's. It's just it's just a lot of you get thrown to a lot of unknown type stuff. Where are you during the show? I'm usually on stage, left stage, right, right, walking around. Um, okay. Obviously, we they carry a lot of pyro concussion, so there's always that um, safety issue with. Uh, obviously, your crew knows what's going on, but if there's bad guests um, or other crew, or you're at a festival, like you got to kind of monitor. You don't want people running across the stage and that. You do a couple of laps around the barricade, check out the supervisor if there's any issues. The crowd is getting rowdy. You kind of go down there. Sometimes where I've had to jump in a crowd, we do a couple of bike shows, I think. And this woman was drunk, was throwing like loose change up at the band. Well, I could see her at nighttime, like the reflection. I'm like, what? It's not raining out. What is that? So you look at it, you get in there, you grab her, you pull her out. So you're always kind of you – the, you let your crew know you're around. You walk to front of the house, check out those guys. Um, if you have spots – kind of touch their toe, let them know you're right there. Yeah. Um, you let them know you're, you're there to wear what's going on. Okay. But there's so many boobits on stage. And then if we go into the crowd, like we always do, there's all that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you and then the guys get off stage, they shower and we hang, they hang out with their family, friends or guests. We get you're, the after still, show you're still on. A, you're still watching. Yeah, that, I'm still right? there. Yep. I have time to kind of, if it's a quiet night, I can shower, just kind of mm-hmm. whatever. But you're walking out to the bus. Um, with them, you're making sure they're set. And then if we're at a festival, sometimes like Zach and I, whoever will grab a golf cart and kind of drive around and just check on people and just, so there's always that aspect where you can, as long as your head's on swivel, man, there's no, I said that to everyone, like just kind of, you can have fun with your job and be good at it. So. Right, 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 right. Wow, man. It's crazy. It just seems like it never ends. You never, you never shut yeah, your brain it, it, off because you're always thinking. Again, you're always anticipating, right? Always planning. Yeah, it's it's one of six more. I like festivals too because you get to be a lot of other bands who have their security guys with them. Or mm. I mean, there's some bands. I think Lumineers have a girl security who's awesome. Uh, but so you meet, you get to see other security guys, and. It's one of those things where, I, like, man, man, if I watch them a little bit, not to nitpick, but maybe I can learn something from them. Right. And I think in this industry, so many people get so they have egos. We're like, oh, I'm the best. I'm the best. Well, you know what, man? If you're at a festival, you better all be the best because we're going right. to need each other to get save lives. And and so it's one of those things too where you have people that get like, I don't want to say butthurt, but there's an ego in my side of the industry where it's like, oh, I want to be the best. I want to. Yeah, well, man, I'm not here for drama. Like, right. I'm here for my gig. Be a good person. I, I'm here to help you. You help me. And you too, man. I, man, I, I've learned so much from people just watching veterans work and stuff. Yeah. But there's also times, too, we see some of these, ba- these guys or girls they bring in where it's just like, you're the best friend. Like, you're not security. Right. right. Like, you're – come on, man. Like, you're just there for the photo ops. Or you're there to hang out and drink beers. Like, 
I'm glad you're here. Try to help out, but you let the pros handle this. And so you kind of right. pull people aside, like, man, you can be a great security guy, but this is what you should do. Unfortunately, though, I think the 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 uh, criteria in your line of work for being the best could mean your own peril because your job is to protect somebody, right? So if you've if you've taken a bullet yeah, for no, someone or something like that, like, great, you were the best that day, and you're fucking dead. Right, and it's one of those things too, where you kind of people are like, "Oh, would you take a bullet for that artist?" Like, we all my family and friends are always like, "Oh, would you die for that artist?" Well, if they're my client, I would. Right. And if the crew was there, I would do it too. Like, I might hate you as a crew chief, or you might be a the biggest prick video guy, or I might hate how you cook in catering. Right. But if something would happen to you, I'd be the first one there to help you. Sure. And so that and same thing. For me same is, thing with a candidate. No, for sure. Like you might right? disagree with everything, but at the end of the day, they're a fa- they're humans. They're a family. They have friends. They have a life. To, they have their life is no different than you and ours. They might say stupid stuff or they might think differently. But I don't. I, mean, I have no time for hate in my industry. Yeah. So is it? I, don't, I just watched that uh, Michelle Obama documentary. Yep. And where she does like the speaking at the. Yeah, she's on her book tour. Yep. And there's about five or eight minutes in there that they dedicate to her. Secret Service guy. Can't remember his yep. name. He's been with her for like day one. Yep. Is it hard when, you, when you're when with someone that long to sort of not let your guard down? I don't mean for oh, Michelle Obama. I mean, no, like, I, I if you're in a secret you, like you let your guard down a little bit, it becomes a little bit more familial. Like how do you maintain like that focus? There, could, there, there, there is a sense of complacency. I think that's where people fail a lot in their job. It doesn't have to be security. It could be your industry yeah, too. I think yeah. people get, oh, I've done the show a hundred times. Well, that hundred and first time, man, it's about to break loose. And those other previous shows don't mean squat. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, you get to, one of those things of working with someone for so long, you get to know just by looking at them, you could tell, like you could look at any politician. I mean, anyone from the treasury who I, you would see all the time, you, you could just look at their face without them even saying hello, that something's wrong. Something happened that's going to come out in the news or there's an issue at home or he's tired or his family member's sick. In the same way with a band or a crew member. Like you, you know, you get adapt those skills. We can look at them and be like, they're mad. They're upset. They're sad. They're happy. And so I think that's a skill people need to kind of – because you can tell so much by so without them even saying a word. Yeah. So. Uh, all right. So tell me now, you know, you, you've got your hands full anyway in this industry. Right. With what you do. Right. Now we have this pandemic. As you look ahead to what shows and live music might look like, what do you think? What do you, what do you, the logistics of this? Yeah. Show? I mean, I, and now you have, by the way, now you got, you know, people like, let's do car things. Let's do like drive in concerts. Well, now you've got an actual machine if you wanted to use it as a fucking weapon. Yeah. I mean, now you're talking literally VBIDs if you wanted. And so it's funny you brought that up. I actually got hit up by a, uh, what we did, a high profile um, drive in company in California and one in Massachusetts that they have talked about we need professional security to sweep cars, um, to think about putting barricades in. And doing this stuff with it because the vehicle aspect is absolutely insane. Yeah, because you know, you a lot of times these venues they're obviously they're not equipped to have cars that close to each other, like literally that close to an artist. And so I don't know how insurance wise, um, yeah, they play it safe. But man, I could put a lot of gasoline, grass seed under my car, and Joe Schmo up there is not going to check my car with his little beer under the car. Like there has to be some sort of accountability for that. Yeah, uh, to happen. But on the same side. I am all for being creative. People get out there. If that's the new norm, who cares? The new norm. I, Brent from Shine Down. He'll. We had a talk last week about this, and like it kind of, kind of run a chord with me because don't let the new norm be a bad thing. If mm-hmm. you have to wash your hands or wait a line an extra fifteen minutes to check your temperature, you're gonna do it because you want you want to get out of the house. You want to see the band. If we could do this safe, I know people with the face masks and. Whatever side you're on, like, just do the best you can to do the right thing. And if the new norm is temperature checks or you got a wait line, you got to wear the special mask, or you can only you can't order food at concessions. They got to bring it to you at your seat. Like, let it let it happen. Okay. Who says what the new? Who says that everyone's like, oh, I want to go back to what was before? Well, maybe in a year or so, it could be better. Right. 
So I know there's a lot of fear in this too, and I totally get that. I, I, I'm scared too for the industry because you're kind of like, what could happen? What's going to happen? But joking aside, you're like, you don't think Live Nation is going to charge an extra twenty dollars to get your temperature checked faster in this line, right? Or set in this VIP box in the amphitheater for a little bit more money, but you don't have to wear a face mask. So there, you can get creative with this, and people are going to still make money on it, right? <laughs> right. And I don't fault them; make the money. So yeah. All right, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna go to one place with you before I let you go, because um, I'm just curious, man. You seem like you know you're you're a straight ahead guy, you got a good head on your shoulders, obviously. Um, how do you feel? You have a lot of friends in your world, folks that protect, okay. folks that protect um, the the public, right? Police, yeah, I mean, all that any, kind of stuff, anyone, every, every, right. all up and down the the chain. When you see all this stuff. There's a lot of this anti-police stuff that's going on. How do you feel about that? I think it's terrible. I think it's stupid. Uh, now, if the conversation, do you think it's a, it, you think it's a big broad stroke? Stroke? You you accept? That I think I think they're, they're just reaching, looking for an issue to grasp on. And here's the thing, and I firmly believe this. I think if you put the time in for training, and no matter what profession you are, but with police. If you're fully trained, keep doing classes, keep learning, Monday quarterback actions of others. If you think someone's doing the wrong thing, call them out on it. I'm all for accountability. But to go out there and say defund the police when – okay, so you want to defund the police, well then, but you are more trained. Well, who's paying for that training? Because you still have to pay the cops. To Who's going to answer the 911 call? Right. A social worker? Okay. Good luck. So right. especially you have all these politicians and celebrities like defund the police. You can afford private security. Or right. if you're a politician in California, you actually have been paying cops to be your security while talking shit about them. Mm. So I'm very pro-law enforcement, but I also think you need to hold people accountable. If you're a bad cop and you don't – man, throw the book at them. But to broad stroke, like you said, an entire group of awesome men and women that serve this country, like I – I have a lot of family and friends. We all do. They're in law enforcement. I, I feel for them every day because they, uh, yes, they chose to do that job to literally take a bullet and get and do run into a burning building. If you're a firefighter, they don't deserve to have that kind of slack thrown their way. And I and I will defend that to the grave. If just, people disagree with me, cool. Don't you can't say I don't care because I do care. Yeah, I see a lot of bad cops, and I see a lot of bad cops not get very far in their career, and they left without a job. So yeah. It's, it's, you know, I, I feel like it's no different than any other thing, right? You, you could say all Wall Streeters are bad people. What? But you're still going to invest to make money. <laughs> you're still going to invest to make money. Right. Not all of them are bad people, right? Not no, they, all they aren't. lawyers are bad people. No, Not, they aren't. I mean, Most you, you are. could say all roadies are uh, fat, drunk, and English and have bad teeth, <laughs> right? Or whatever you right. want to fucking say, but that's not true. No, it's um, not God. No, and they like you said, tea, some but. some people, some some bad people are able somehow, against all odds, to accelerate in their careers and find themselves in positions of power. And right, and I think people need to hold them accountable. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it could be anyway. You could be a rookie. You could be a veteran that's going to retire in two hours. Yeah, you still have that duty to hold people in your profession accountable for their actions. Because yeah. I mean, like you said, you represent not only yourself, your family. But the blue line, you represent your human race. And so to attack the law enforcement like that, I, I kind of shake my head. But on the same side of it, I'm just like, now I'm getting calls to these estate security people that want private security now because they have these people that are on both sides of it that are – like what's the thing in Missouri a couple of days ago, that um, couple that came out with the guns? Yeah. yeah. Like um, we, right or wrong, that type of stuff to start popping up now – and so you get a lot of people thinking, you're like, you're like, well, do I fund the police? If the police were there, that would have happened. Well, if the police aren't there next time, next time there could be. Like, so you don't know. And I'm just sit back. I'm like, man, I just – everyone bite your tongue. I think the good will always rise. Mm -hmm. The bad people will get sorted. Just let let them get sorted out. Yeah. Don't keep hiding the bullshit either. Right, right, right. John, man, I wish you luck. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I very much appreciate you coming on the show and, and giving us your, your, your story here and what you do and giving us a glimpse behind the curtain at what goes on out there. Yeah, awesome. Oh, good. Thank you. John, my man, thank you for keeping us safe out there, buddy. We appreciate you. We appreciate you. 
Guys, we'll see you next week. Episode 175, man, with Megan Holmes. Global sales over at 8th Day Sound in Los Angeles. During the week, you can follow us at Facebook, Instagram, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and Spotify. All is Roadie Free Radio. Check out the website, roadiefreeradio.com. Send me a note because you know I want to hear from you. That is info at roadiefreeradio.com. And my friends, in the meantime, y'all be safe out there. No rock and roll.